Oh, okay. How is everyone doing this morning? Good? <laughs> okay, so this morning in prayer, um, there was a lot of amazing things that were shared. And um, what just struck my heart was all week I've had this song stuck in my head. I don't know how it got in my head, but it was there. And I've just been singing it around my house, in my room, in the shower, I don't know. And <laughs> um, it's the song Joy to the World, Joy, Unspeakable Joy, an Overflowing Well. And it just hit me that we are God's overflowing well to reach the community with our joy and happiness and show them that it's not all sad. The world is not, well, the world might be out to get us, but God is not out to get us. And he just loves us so much. And um, I was reading this uh, passage from the Bible, Luke 2, the Passion Translation, verse 10. But the angel reassured them, saying, Don't be afraid, for I have come to bring you good news, the most joyous news the world has ever heard. And it is for everyone everywhere. So I just want to proclaim that and show that we are God's joy to spread out amongst the community and amongst the world.
welcome you in this place today.
I think this would be a good moment for a praise prayer update testimony. Stephanie, you want to share it now? Wait till you hear this. You may not remember Stephanie. Well, I'll let you tell us, Steph. I'm not going to. You tell it well. Come on up here so we can all see you, though. No, you tell it great. Go ahead. Hello. Um, <laughs> this summer, my dad was diagnosed with um, lymphoma in his stomach, and he's been going through chemo treatments, and he's been really, really suffering um, and uh, he was actually in the hospital for the f two weeks before Christmas. He got a virus because his immune system was so low from the chemo, and it's just been a really um, rough road for him. But Christmas Eve, he got discharged from the hospital, and he was sent home with the news that the most recent tests show he is 100% cancer-free. How many of you know it's really important to make sure that God gets as much glory as the devil got when the need was first shared? That's the spirit of testimony. Who else has one? Oh, don't look at me like that. <laughs> it's not scary up here. Glorify God with what he's done. You got a testimony. I know that don't make me call you out. I know who some of you are. I'm avoiding eye contact because I don't want to pressure you or shame you. Come on. Glorify God. What's he done? So real quick, share the, what the need was, and then a lot about what God did. Um, God took me to a, a new job, and, and I didn't even know I needed one, but he, know, he knew I did. And, and um, it was effortless. It, it took two months, so I learned some lessons. He taught me some lessons along the way, but to, to God be the glory for that, because our family is getting better, and it's, it's healing and I'm sleeping better. So, so God shut that door after 25 and a half years, I might add. And he opened a new one and, and praise God for that, right? Amen. It was a fun, awkward, scary transition time, but I praise God, Jim. Who else? Who else has like, for example, a financial testimony? This is a this is a million dollar baby. <laughs> That's funny. So the Lord, uh, you know, you can have loss in your life, or many losses, but the Lord restores. That's His heart, is to restore. And uh, the Bible says that you know, forget the former things. Behold, I am doing a new thing. It's springing up. Let's perceive. Let's perceive it. We perceive your new thing today, Lord. Amen. Amen. So Dan was holding the testimony. <laughs> Come on, one more. I know that they're out there. So now I feel like a third grade teacher. I'll wait. Rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. I have a, something is coming up that uh, God took care of for me before. There's a shift change and uh, they're doing a selection next week, not this coming week, but the following week. There's 14 positions for a uh, day shift, and I'm number 27 of 28 people. But I'm rejoicing the Lord because he already has it written where I'm going to be. So rejoice with me, please rejoice. <laughs> Warren shared earlier how God did it before, so he's gonna do it again, that's the spirit of testimony. You testify God did it before, and that's what produces faith that he will do it again. 
usually because he's taken us up to greater risks of faith along the journey. Come on, how about one more? We've had some amazing things happen in lives this year. Yes. See, you were one of the ones I was avoiding eye contact with. Come on up here so we can see you. Now you can't hide from me. So the arm has sort of healed, sort of not, but that's not my testimony. Um, October, I had to have another nerve test done. And I was really reluctant because it was going to cost a couple thousand dollars that I definitely did not have to put into more tests. I called Nationwide five times and every time they said, your case is closed, we're not paying for it. And I'm like, okay, God, like if you wanna have this test done, you're gonna have to make it work. And so October I had the test done and the week before Thanksgiving, I got a paper in the mail from the EOB explanation of benefits and I see the cost and I'm like, God, I don't have that. And a week later, I got another envelope in the mail and it was a paper from Nationwide stating that they're covering the whole thing. So even when the world says, no, I ain't doing that, God says, don't believe that because I have the answer and I'm gonna do that. Come on, do you understand what God did there? God softened the heart of insurance executives. Oh, yeah, we'll pay for that. Come on, when does that happen? <laughs> All right, who's got an impossible need in front of you right now? Raise your hand if you got something in front of you right now. If God doesn't move, it's not going to happen. Come on, put your hands up. God's going to do it. This is, you know, we felt while we were praying before service today that God wanted to like resurrect and, and revive our faith, that we would walk that way and stop giving so much glory to the problems and situations. That's, that's like devil worship. That's what we do. We talk so much about what's wrong, so much about what the problem is, and only a little bit about, yeah, well, I know that God could do that. Well, let's glorify God. You see a hand up around you, lay your hands on that person for a moment. And let's pray. I'll pray. And impart your faith. Impart your, right now, your anointing into that person. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon you because he's anointed you to bring good news. So we speak good news to these hearts right now in Jesus' name, that right now these hearts will receive good news, that before the need was even known, God already had the answer to it. And I pray that kind of faith right now will rise up in the heart of every one of these saints who's facing an impossible situation. May their heart say, yeah, it might look impossible, but with God, all things are possible. I pray that that will be the testimony of their heart, that even in the middle of waiting for the testimony to finish, even in the midst of waiting for the answers, waiting for that mountain to move, there will not be a moment. May they not waver in unbelief according to the promise of God. May they be like Abraham, the faith of Abraham be your portion right now. You'll not waver to the left or right. You won't even look to the left or right. Your faith is steadfast, immovable, knowing that you belong to the Lord. You belong to the King of all kings. He loves you. May the love of God penetrate through the revelation of how deeply, how deeply we're loved of God, penetrate into every one of these hearts, that there'll be no wavering, no waxing back and forth, no emotional roller coasters anymore in Jesus' name. We proclaim an end to the emotional roller coaster, no more spins and loops of the heart. We say right now the peace of God which goes beyond what can be understood keeps your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Every anxious thought right now melts away in the presence of the Lord. Every anxiety, every fear, every whisper of the accuser. Oh, I even say right now that where the accuser has come and said, you deserve this thing, you brought this on yourself. That those lies right now fall to the ground. The grace of God replaces that lie of the enemy. That you made your bed, now you're going to have to lie in it. That lie drops to the ground right now in Jesus' name. May it no longer plague your thoughts. Take that thought and arrest it right now. and Put it back in jail where it belongs. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, let faith arise in all of us. Let faith arise in every one of us. And we would live that way. God, remove us from carnal thinking. Remove us. Move us out of the place where we think through. And once we got to figure it out, then we trust you. Take us out of that place and on a crazy, wild journey of faith. 
I want to tell you what the word of the Lord was as we were praying before service, that God's taking us out into places beyond. Lisa, help me with the words again. The, the About scary going into the unknown and stepping out into things. I'm botching it right now. But the Lord was all over it about risking it, about stepping out and doing things that just appear like that's crazy. We how could we possibly even go that? Enlarging our expectations. That's what it was. That we'd increase our expectation. That what God promised, He will perform. May there be nothing in Jesus' name in our mind that inhibits what the Word of the Lord has said will come to pass. Nothing that will cause us to waver at those promises. In Jesus' name. All right, come on, let's bless Him now. Let's praise Him. Let's worship Him some more. Take that thing, that anxiety, that mountain right now and lay it before the Lord and watch how small it gets in the light of His presence. This is my story.
we're closing out a year. That's the time when a lot of people are making their resolutions, doing all kind of stuff and taking stock of their lives and recognize that depending on the kind of year one has had, how you look at the year can really be either a source of great joy or a source of tremendous grief and remorse. And I'll share some thoughts about that today and the message, but I just felt to take a moment for us to pray for each other. The Lord said, not just to his people back in the day through the prophet Jeremiah, but to all of his people for all time. I know the plans I have for you. I don't know what plans you've been looking at, the Lord says. I don't know what you think is going to happen next. Maybe you, in your heart, you've charted a course for yourself. I don't know. But I know the plans that I have for you, and my plans involve prospering you. My plans involve no punishment, no visiting you with some kind of pain because of the choices you made that you now regret. No, no, no. Choices not to, my, my plans are not to harm you but to give you a hope-filled future. The Lord is saying to us, I believe so strong in my heart, it is vital. How many know it's always important to have a hopeful view of the future? We worship the God of all hope. There's no other choice. But how many know that, that God sometimes has to take hold of our hearts to help us to actually see things that way, to actually look at the future as if it's actually going to get better from here. That whatever's behind us, those were the, maybe the, you, we call them the good old days. Let's say those were the bad old days because it only gets better from here. So Lord, I pray for the one I'm holding right now. And we all lift before you, our brothers and sisters, and ask you to lift up our eyes to a place where we could see what your intentions are. Where we could stop Ringing our, wringing our hands and turning over in our hearts with anxiety and whatever negative thoughts we have about the future, whatever pessimistic thoughts we have, we lay those aside right now and look to you to build in our lives a hope-filled future. Give us a gift of hope right now. We ask you, Lord, to help us to lay aside the things gone by. We know some of us need more help than others, but we all need help in leaving behind the things which are yesterday. May we be able to say at the end of the day, yeah, it came to pass. So let the past be past. Let an awesome, hope-filled view of what you have in store for us next grip our hearts with such an expectation Go, we'll go out leaping like the calves of the stall we looked at. May we go out with joy that bubbles over. As we were praying before service today, I heard the popping of corks, which will for sure happen all around the world on Tuesday night. It's going to be corks popping. Happy New Year. For some people, they mean it. Happy New Year. We got a great expectation for some. It's just kind of this facade. Yeah, Happy New Year, but my life's falling apart right now, so... Let me drink some of the contents of this bottle I just popped to wash away my sorrows. But for us, I believe the Lord's popping off the cork of our expectation, our hope, and our joy. That we're going to bubble over with what's real on the inside. No more of this nonsense about, well, you know, I'm just trying to be real. And all we think is real is the negative. All we think is real is the, the view of the future which says, yeah, things have fallen apart. Now we reject that. And we say the Lord's got other things in mind for His people. The Lord's got other things in mind for us. So Jesus, we pop the cork of holding back on releasing our heart with a hope-filled expectation, with a joyful expectation. Spirit, baptize us fresh with the same oil of joy you put on Jesus, who could be a man of sorrows acquainted with grief and yet be anointed with the oil of joy more than anybody else alive. Give us that kind of an anointing today. We, we call on you. I pray especially for those who are numbered among us right now who are filled with grief, filled with a genuine, realistic sense of something lost, something missing right now that once was in, in our lives, a genuine feeling 
of, of remorse and loss and grief. I, I'm, we pray right now, Spirit, that you will pour out the oil of joy even on that. Change even our perspective on the bad things gone by. We'd be able to see how you're going to use it. We'd be able to see your hand at work making everything work together for our good. Even those things that we were at fault for. Even the things that were done to us that were out of our control. Open our eyes with wonder as we just sang. Show us who we are. Fill us with your love. We could go out with joy. Be led forth in peace. So those mountains and hills, they're not going to be in our way anymore. No, they're going to break forth into singing before us. We decree it because it's your word and we agree with it because it's already settled in heavenly places where nothing ever changes. Amen. Amen. Go ahead. You can hug a couple people if you want and take a minute. You're here. <laughs> Get ready to share that. That's going to be amazing. Wait till you hear this. You're going to have to wait, though. I mean, literally, wait till you hear that. All right, we have some announcements, right? All right, first, the ushers are ready to serve us. First of all, in case you missed it last week, Merry Christmas, by the way. Hope you have an awesome expectation of the new year. But if you weren't with us last week and missed it, Hillside Christian Fellowship is now debt-free. In fact... Exceeding above and beyond debt-free, we have a surplus because of the generosity of all of you who gave into that special offering. So God bless you as you give. Um, we do have, we are still receiving that offering though. Um, the Lord, uh, the first day we announced it, several people came and said, we're going to receive exceedingly more than we need for that. So if God laid something on your heart to give toward that, it was toward the mortgage on the building. Now it's going to go to whatever we need it for for the ministry. There have been some things on hold while we've been trying to rebuild our finances here at the church, and uh, they're no longer on hold. But if God laid something on your heart, still obey the Lord. We weren't just giving because there was a need. We don't flow that way in the new covenant. We give because God's generous, and now we're generous, and we have a generous spirit. So that's what that's all about. So praise God for that and thank you. I, I can't, I mean, I was overwhelmed when Wayne told me the, uh, after the first week, Wayne told me the, what, you know, had come in and we'd been weighing whether we should put like one of those thermometers up in the front, you know, like we're almost there. And by the end of the first week, we were already three quarters of the way there. So the, it was the word of the Lord. God is on it. And I believe God wants to do more than just set the church free. Of debt, I believe, you know, we're leading the way. The church now as a body, we are debt-free. We have no more mortgage. Praise God. This beautiful facility is all ours. <laughs> that's just great. Every one of my friends who comes in here, all the pastors who come through, praise God. They just love this facility, and I do too. I think it's just a great spot for us. We're right in the borough. It's newish. It's clean. I say ish because, you know, it's, there are some things that need to be done. So, again, if you still want to contribute toward that make sure you designate it and you have till uh till tuesday to get it in because then the calendar turns and then it's next year and well you know you missed the boat but you could get on another boat that's you know that's all right um all right we are so we're believing god now that the church we're debt free we took care of the house of the lord <clears throat> now the lord's going to take care of every one of our houses so i want to pray something right now and um and i'm going to announce again about financial peace university if you have any debt in your life. Would you please stand up? It should be most everybody. I mean, we're Americans. I'll tell you what, one of the most eye-opening encounters I've had with our Liberian friends was when uh, one of them came here. I think it was Owen Dunbar was here, and I drove him around a little bit, and he was just in awe, first of the paved roads, which he just loved, 
All the roads were paved, even the ones I said were bad. He says, Steve, this is the best road in Liberia, and it's the worst road in your neighborhood. They were in all of that, but then they were in all, he was in all of the houses, how big they were and how nice they were and the lawns and the size of them and all that. And I said, yeah, but very few Americans actually own their houses. And he, his jaw dropped, and he said, what? I uh, said, so yeah, we all have mortgages. The bank loans us money so that we could pay an excessive amount of money for you know, the house as compared to what it used to be. And so really the banks own most American houses. And, and he looked at me and I said, you know, and he said, you don't have that in Liberia, do you? Because nobody can qualify for any kind of a loan in Liberia. But if they have a house, they own it. And they've literally built it with their own two hands many times. And so I realized that, man, that is the fifth poorest nation on earth, and yet in reality, they're wealthier than most Americans. So I believe God has something else in mind for us. And I'll be the first to lead the way, and I'll share with you, I have been horrible with finances all my life. I've repented of it, and God's restoring it, and I'm going to tell you something that, that God did to change my heart about it. I believed that because I incurred the debt, obviously I'm responsible to pay it off right? I mean, that's just good. It's good. You shouldn't, you know, declare bankruptcy. You shouldn't accumulate debt and then declare bankruptcy and basically steal from all those who loan to you, right? That's not biblical. It's not right. But I believed that this is an area I shouldn't give to the Lord because I incurred the debt, so I should pay it off. And I'll never forget when the Lord first spoke to me through a prophet and then just started showing me his word. Son, all of your debts have been forgiven. What was it about your sin debt? Your debt to society, as we call it. Your debt to those who love you. Your debt to all of those that you've hurt throughout your life. You're going to repay that too? Do you want to make your own salvation while you're at it? And I felt really rightly rebuked of the Lord. So first I want to urge you, all of us who are standing, let's just first of all repent of incurring debt. And I know it's just considered normal, right? You're an American, so of course you're going to take out a loan to buy a car. Of course you're going to take out a loan to buy a house. I don't believe God wants us to continue on that streak. I think God wants to do something brand new. This is one of my favorite Dave Ramsey statements. You know, he said, well, I, you know, uh, breaking news, spoiler alert, the Joneses are broke too. <laughs> so stop trying to keep up with them. That we repent of that. We repent of living in such a way that says, I will have what I right now can't afford. And that, that's the heart behind debt. I want to buy something that I don't have enough money for right now. That's the beginning of it. But it doesn't end there. All of our debts were nailed on a cross, including the financial mistakes that we've made. So whether you incurred an abundant amount of credit card debt or whatever other stuff you've got, put it on that cross right now together with me. And let's believe God. As he retired the debt of our church, our church family, he's going to retire the debt of every one of our natural families. So uh, if you have a wallet, grab hold of it or something like that or whatever you want to hold on to in faith and, and just pray together with me. God, we say right now that whether we incurred debt in a way that was really crazy bad or just bad or whatever reason we have for having debt. Some of us have debts that were unjust. Whatever the reason is for our debt right now, we put it on the cross and ask you, as you've forgiven the debt of our sin, will you forgive the debt of our finances? Teach us to be wise with our money. Teach us how to handle our money in such a way that it glorifies you and accumulates wealth for generations to come. But would you set us free from our mistakes like you've done all the other things? Would you set us free from all the ways that we have just botched it when it comes to our money? Where our treasure is, our heart is also. And we want to be able to demonstrate with our treasure that our heart belongs to you. To be able to be exceeding abundant generous for everything going on about the kingdom of heaven and the earth. Release the finances of your people that your kingdom will be as well financed as you've made it to be. Come and make us wealthy. Come and make us a model and an example on how it's supposed to be. Make us countercultural as a people. That we won't just go along with the way the world around us does it and justify it just because everybody else does it that way. No, make us a people that make people stop and wonder. How do you do it? You just seem so free. Thank you, Jesus. I pray you gift us with faith to turn the dead around and transform it into wealth. Amen. Amen. You know, it's one of the things, my, you can sit down if you were 
uh, standard for that. One of the things that I loved about the Amish, you know, being from New York and then Boston, I used to make fun of the Amish. I feel bad about that now that I know some. There's one thing, they excel at many things. They do. And one of them is they really do live debt-free. They buy their houses with cash. They buy their farms with cash. They live on cash. And they are wealthier than most people realize because of that. That's the norm. So let's break free of that mold. Can you show the commercial for FPU? Hi, I'm Chris O. Have you ever done something stupid with money? I know I have. I mean, when I was in my 20s, I wanted people to think I was successful. I got caught up in trying to keep up with the Joneses. So I got the bank to loan me money because, of course, I didn't have any. And I went out and bought a Ford Expedition. I know, not the car you'd necessarily choose. I made $600 car payments every month for almost five years to own a hunk of metal. Thinking about that car hurts. You know what I'm talking about. Because if it's not a car payment, it's a credit card bill or maybe even a student loan. No matter how you spend it, you owe your income to someone else. But what if you could invest that payment for your future? You'd be able to retire with wealth and dignity. You'd leave a legacy for generations to come. Wow. Or how about this one? What if you could give that payment to a single mom who's struggling to get by? What if you could give it to your church? You see, debt is a thief. It steals your joy. It steals your freedom, and it keeps you from living the life God wants for you. And if you're ready to get out of debt, save and invest, and make giving a part of your daily life, it's time to make a change. And Financial Peace University can help. Over 5 million people have already been through this program, and they've learned God's ways of handling money. And now, you can too. Amen. So uh, we are going to begin a group here on Thursday nights, starting on January 9th. If you need child care, you have to sign up so we know to get child care. There's a sheet out in the lobby. It's only going to cost you $85 to buy the materials for it. we got a bulk rate discount on purchasing is usually about $185. If you need assistance because your finances are that messed up, which by the way would have been me at a point in my life, I would have not have been able to afford the $85 to take a class to learn how to manage my money well. So if that's you, that's okay. We have money set aside so that we can bless you. And you can take the class and learn how to manage your money in a really good godly way. There are more scriptures on the topic of money than any other single subject when it comes to practical nuts and bolts of life. So there's a lot the Word has to say, and there's a lifestyle that God has for us so that we could all be free. Amen? So um, make sure you sign up. Please try to do it today so that we can get the ball rolling on plans and all of that. If Thursday nights don't work for you, Regals is offering the class at the same, during the same time period on Monday nights, right? It's Monday. So you can join with a group over there and still connect with us. Dave has offered financial counseling, Dave and Lori. If you want some individual help, they've offered to sit with you, go over your budget with you. I could tell you that it is totally safe to be with them and work things out like that. Lay it all out and let them help you to work out a plan that you could be debt-free. Ruth, how long did it take you guys once you got on the plan before you rolled away all your debt and you... You got that awesome Camaro because you were debt-free and had cash. (laughs) I should have had you drive up with that today. That's what we needed. (laughs) How long did it take? Four years. Okay, so four years and just a little bit left to go on the house. All right, so it is possible. It's, It's awesome, so let's do it. What else? Can you put another slide up? I forgot what else I'm supposed to tell you about. Oh, after church today... We're going to um, take down all the Christmas decorations. We're having a wedding here this Saturday, and uh, we want to get all the Christmas decorations down. So if you can stick around, I think it'll take about 20 minutes if we have enough help. We're just going to pull everything down, put it in boxes, and put it up in the storage room upstairs. So Amber is going to be in charge of that. We'll meet up right over here in this corner and get a plan, and then we'll do that right after church. So um, again, 20 minutes. And then this Saturday, wait, January 4th is what day of the week? So I was right, Saturday. This Saturday is also the Young Adult Life Group is joining together again. You can decide if you're young or if you're an adult. That's up to your designation. You decide what demographic you belong in. Most of us fits in one of those two 
categories, but it meets at the Stansfield's house, great life-giving group uh, to join with, and they're starting back up again. So if you haven't connected with a life group, if you're new to Hillside, that's how we roll around here. If you want to be cared for, loved on, and connected, rooted and established in love here at Hillside, we don't have programs for that. Our program is community. Our program is building family, and that's how it gets done. So if you haven't connected yet deeply in some kind of fellowship or team here at the church, that's a great group to join and uh, come together. Really life-giving, joyful group. So, um, Liz, did I get all the details right? Go oh, there you are. Great. Okay. All right. Kids, come on down to the front. And who's teaching? Who's doing the uh, announcement for that today? Megan. All right. Good morning. So this Christmas, we, um, last week we kind of took a break from our regular curriculum and we discussed the gifts of the Spirit. And now this week we're back with our mile runners and we are going into um, the last week of Jesus when he was here on earth before he was crucified. So we're going to be talking about um, his journey into Jerusalem. Amen. I want to... Uh we really felt like God wants us to grab hold of hope and have it become like a part of our DNA. That, that's not just something we know about, but something that becomes cultural. That we are a people who are all looking toward the future with a hopeful outlook. That God's going to do things, even if we can't figure it out or understand how he's going to do it, that we just have that hope-filled view of what's going to happen next. So I want to share with you some thoughts today about living without regrets. Living in such a way that, first of all, we're wise enough that we don't do things we'll later regret. Like my mom used to say, you're going to regret that. And she was always right. And she'd see to it that I regretted it if life didn't do it. You know what I mean? But then there are also those regrets that come where regret just has a hold on us, where we're so filled with remorse for things gone by. That, that things that we did or things that we had no control over and were filled with this view of our, our past that kind of makes its way into the present and wrecks everything. So before I share, Jamie um, just came to me and he has this awesome testimony of things. Jamie, 13 years ago, had, had something happen. You can get as detailed as you want. I've found that the more detailed some people will be set free just at knowing what happened there. But Jamie's got an awesome testimony of how God took a mess and made it a ministry. Um, a lot of you know what went through with with my fam, well, with me, with my job. I worked at Starbucks. I got in trouble. Um, I actually was stealing money from Starbucks. Um, went through the whole legal thing. God saw me through it. Um, and then I got a job at the school which took us from like what I was making at Starbucks to half the amount of money. And um, to give a plug to Dave and Lori, they sat down with Melissa and I, and Ruth and Dave sat down with us and helped us get through that with making, Melissa was going to school, I was the only one bringing in money, helped us put a budget together to get through that time. Well, that was 13 years ago. Um, I've been working at the school for 13 years, and I just had something in me. You know, I started going to school at Hack, um, and I just had something in me like I had more to give, but I wasn't, like, fulfilling that at the school. And I put in applications all the time, and... Never heard anything from it. Well, I saw this one job, and I'm like, ah, I'll put in my resume. 45 minutes later, I got an email saying, hey, we like your resume. Can we set up a phone interview? Okay. <clears throat> Did a phone interview. They're like, okay, um, that sounds great. We need a sit-down interview. Okay, we did that. Or like, okay, after the sit-down interview, we're offering you the job, but we need you to have one more interview with the people uh, that you, you would be working with to make sure you're a good fit. I'm like, okay. <clears throat> so I had that interview. 
Um, left the interview, I was feeling great. Was in Harrisburg, went to Costco. It was like a half hour later, I got the phone call saying, hey, we offered you the job. Um, they want you to come on. Can you come in Saturday and fill out paperwork? No problem. Melissa drove me down to Harrisburg. I was sitting filling out the paperwork and they were like, okay, here's the job description and here is your salary. And I looked at the salary. And <laughs> my jaw dropped. Because not only was it making so much more than when I was at the school, it was making almost 10,000 more than I did when I was at Starbucks. So, and I've been fighting with this for 13 years about how much I messed up doing what I did, but God turned it around and um, blessed, blessed me and my family with more than I could ever possibly think of. Jamie, I want to give you a word. Is, all right, Melissa, can you come over here? I want you guys to extend your hands to them because you're about to experience something. The, you know, the Bible speaks of cycles of seven, right? There's a six years of labor and then the Sabbath year, six days of the week and then the Sabbath day. And you're coming into the 14th year now after this incident happened. So the first seven you sowed, you know, in corruption and there were some things that you reaped in your life. I tell you what a joy it's been to walk with you on this journey like this, but you're coming into the end of it and the Sabbath year that you have ahead of you, you haven't even, you testified about how God's going to bless you, how he did with this. You haven't even seen the beginning of it yet. These are the first fruits, first fruits of what God's doing right now with the two of you. He's going to prosper you beyond your wildest imagination. As your soul prospers, your financial prosperity is going to just grow from here. It's been an awesome thing to behold, and we bless what the Lord's doing right now. Truly a miraculous testimony of how you've taken what the enemy sought to destroy these two Sought to bury this man under a pile of shame and guilt and regret. Tried to bury his whole life, not just his finances, but his very life. You tried to destroy this man, and today he stands on top of a mountain of grace. And these first fruits we wave before you right now as just the beginning. For truly the Lord has seen your generosity. He has seen your spirit. How you've sown in seasons of lack. How you've given when you didn't even have it to give. How you've opened your home. You've opened your lives. You have opened your wallet to those in need. Even when you couldn't afford to. You've given generously and the Lord is going to blow you away. He is going to overwhelm you with things, blessings. I'm seeing blessings coming from places unexpected. Blessings coming to you from sources that you didn't even know existed. The Lord's going to overwhelm you with this. This job is just the beginning. I pray, God, that you will come and overwhelm them, and may they receive it with grateful hearts, knowing that your grace has worked all things together for their good because they love you, because they're called according to your purposes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 I love you guys. Praise God. All right, so that's a perfect object lesson. I don't need to preach. <laughs> the power of regret, especially when we've made a mistake, even though we know that God forgives, even though we know that God you know, makes all things new, that each and every day, His mercies are new every morning. We know these things in our mind, but I want to poke a little bit and prod a little bit and exhort us today to break free of all that stuff. Because how we view our past absolutely affects how we view our future. If we view our past with phrases in our hearts or minds like, well, I made that mistake, so I've got to pay for that. Like I just shared about financial debt. That was me that incurred the debt, so I should have to pay it off. It's to take the gospel as if now we have to work for our salvation. We have to work for the grace of God. You know who knew this better than anybody? It was Paul. 
I don't know all of what was in that man. We don't know much about what things needed to be sanctified in his life. We see a couple moments where he let Barnabas have it and he wasn't a merciful man sometimes, like with, uh, what's his face, B- uh, Barney's nephew. Um, what was his name? Mark, John Mark. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> John Mark, he wasn't very merciful with that. So we know that he had some issues to work out. But in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said these immortal words. He said, you know, I, I, I am the least of the apostles. I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle. You know why? Because I persecuted the church of Jesus Christ. Paul, at one point in his life, gave his whole heart, fully believing he was serving the Lord, to lock up Christians in prison, throw away the key, and never hear from them again till they rotted and died in that jail cell. That was Paul's beginning till he got knocked off his high horse on the road to Damascus and became the most zealous of all the apostles. So he said, I'm the least of the apostles. I know in my heart, I know I'm not even actually worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. What's your because I? That's a good question. If you believe that you are not a valid recipient of the grace of God for any need in life, the cross goes beyond just forgiveness of sins. It goes into, it penetrates everything to do with life now and life forevermore. So if there's an aspect of our lives that we believe the cross is not touching that aspect of my life right now, maybe it's because we've been trying to work for what's already been purchased for us. This is the power of regret. When we look, regret just means I'm looking at the past and I have such remorse over what I did, I can't even open my heart wide to receive the grace of God. So Paul said, I'm not worthy because I persecuted the church. Nevertheless, that's another way of saying but. Back to that watcher but thing. Nevertheless, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. So yeah, I know what I did. Everywhere Paul went, he had a reminder in front of his face, especially the closer he got to Jerusalem, of all the families he destroyed in his zeal for the house of the Lord as he understood it before he came to know Jesus. Everywhere he was faced with the memory of what he used to do. But he said, nevertheless, by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. In other words, Once I came to a revelation that it's all by grace, and Paul wrote about grace like nobody who's ever lived wrote about the grace of God. Paul had such a revelation of the grace of God, he was accused of teaching that you should sin so that you could get more grace. They actually accused him of that. To which he said, what are you, nuts? But that's another story for another day. By the grace of God I am what I am and his grace toward me wasn't in vain. Why? Because I went and ministered more than any other apostle. Once I got a hold of the grace of God and my regrets were crucified, I went whole hog in on the call of God in my life. And that's what, that's what the call of God is. And that's what we're, uh, I want to exhort us today about getting free of the power of that regret. Because regret makes us focus on what's behind instead of leaning into what's ahead. Regrets like trying to drive looking in the rear view mirror. I just shared recently that testimony you had about the truck with the cross on it. <laughs> we, you all know what I'm talking about? Should I share it again? All right, so Robert was driving. Was it on 81 or something like that? He was driving on the highway, and he cut off a Mack truck, which is not a good plan usually, right? But, but God was speaking to him, and he was, was it at the moment you were in your mind rehearsing some things that you regrets, like things you'd done? He was thinking of that, and then he looked up in his rear view mirror to see if Mac was about to hit his rear, and it, it was one of those trucks that had a lit cross on the front of it, and the Lord spoke to him, when you look in your past, that's all I want you to see. Only thing that's behind you, you know that, that song, I was thinking about that song while we were praying before service, um, I've decided to follow Jesus, and one of the verses I now disagree with, although I love the song, The cross before me, the world behind me. Now I'd say if you put the cross behind you, so that's all you see when you look in the past, now you got a wide open world in front of you. Now we got a wide open world full of opportunity to express the love, the mercy, the grace, all the things that we've received. The world's now wide open in front of us. We can go out without fear. We can go out without wondering when the next shoe's going to drop. Because all we can see behind us now 
is the cross. That it, yes, even that was taken care of. Yes, even that. Even that thing you did yesterday, even that thing you did an hour ago on your way to church, <laughs> it's still behind you, and that's where only the cross exists. The cross is not the final place. The cross is the beginning of a new place. The cross of Jesus is the door. He said, come through me, and now you've got a wide open world in front of you. I want to exhort us today to live. Lean into what's ahead. No more of this garbage of carrying around this baggage of things behind us. No more of this, this stuff about, yeah, but because I did that, therefore God can't. Let's change that equation around to, yeah, but because God did what He did, therefore I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So in Isaiah 43, and somebody even prayed this this morning, I don't know if you even knew, this was the word of the Lord to us at the beginning of this year. I want to close out the year reminding us of some things so that we could once and for all fully step into it as a church. Do not call to mind the former things or ponder things of the past. To ponder means to think about, meditate on it. Keep rehearsing it in your mind which is to really resurrect that memory. How many of you know that when, when you keep thinking about things that have happened in the past, you're reliving it? This is why bitterness, this is where bitterness comes from. Whether it's a person you're bitter with or events of life which leads to getting bitter against God, it's because of rehearsing things that have already happened, but every time you think about it again, your emotions, your entire soul begins to experience that again. When it gets really, when it really gets a hold of you, that's when you're waking up in a cold sweat or you're waking up mad at somebody that you haven't seen for years. It's like it just happened all over again. That's pondering the things of the past. When you remember that time you got fired unjustly over and over again, or you remember that time that a thief came and literally stole your stuff, and you rehearse it again, pondering the things of the past, you just lived it all over again. And that's, why we, that's how we make mountains out of molehills. Right? This is all about it. When, when it comes to offense, the original offense is much smaller than what we think it is 10 years down the road. Why? It's as if that person's done it a thousand times since, even though they only said that once. Because we've been pondering it, rehearsing those things from the past. So don't call to mind those former things. Don't ponder the things of the past. Why? Because I'm going to do something new. I'm doing a new thing. It's a new day. It's new mercies. Remember the sunrise thing from last week? This is a new day. Everything's being made new. Don't ponder those things because it's going to spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? And that's a legitimate question. Because if we're looking behind and our focus and our pondering, our meditation is on what's past, how are we going to see what God's doing over here? How can we be aware of what God is up to right now when our memories are always going back and dragging us back into that place where that pain was? or that you know, sorrow, whatever it was, if we continue to live that way. No, God said, look, I want you to stop pondering those things because I want you to be aware of what I'm doing. Because if you're aware of what I'm doing, in heaven, we're always hopeful. In heaven, we've already seen the end of the story. And like Bob Mumford said, he turned to the back of the Bible and said, we win. <laughs> in heaven, they've already experienced the return of the Lord. Think about this. In heaven's reality... Jesus is already back. We're already all living in paradise together. God, Jesus is experiencing that moment right now. We who are still stuck in this time-bound universe, we're experiencing life unfold. But heaven's atmosphere is always full of hope because they've already experienced the end of the book. It's like when you're reading a good novel and you just can't wait, and you turn to the end of the novel and you find out how it goes on. In some ways it makes the novel boring, but that doesn't make life boring. When we know how it ends, when we know that there's a hope-filled future that God has in store for us, it gives us the capacity to go into life face first, unafraid, totally courageous. Nothing that's ever happened before is going to prevent us from doing what lies ahead. And I want to speak a word into the life of this church. We did it last week, but I want to say it again now while some are here that weren't here last week. As we burn that mortgage... I really felt the, the Spirit of God was all over that. I had everybody who's been a part of the church since the beginning come forward. Those who have carried the weight of the house when twice the house was divided and nearly destroyed. And yet you carried the church spiritually and you carried the church financially. So I gave honor to those who have done that in the days gone by. 
But this new thing that God was doing, we stood right here, right? <laughs> There's the, uh, the memory of it right there, some ashes. I'll never forget. <laughs> okay? So we burned it right here, and it felt prophetically that God was saying, I'm canceling your financial debt, but I'm also canceling the debt of everything that was ever said, everything that was ever done against this house. By every voice and every person who ever prophesied harm, we're, I won't even repeat the words that have been said about this church. That those debts are hereby canceled, never to be brought up again. Mistakes of leadership, mistakes of saints that are part of the church, they are not to be discussed anymore. Do not call to mind the former things or ponder the things of the past. They have no bearing on what happens from here on out. I felt like there's a grace coming on everyone, and most especially all of you who have been a part of this church since the beginning. I have felt your pain in the place of intercession so many times as I've carried this church before the Lord, knowing how much zeal there was at the beginning of this church 21 years ago, knowing how people literally sold stuff to be able to dive in with, with all reckless abandon into the work of God to have Hillside Christian Fellowship here. I mean, all on every wall of this church are the blood, sweat, and tears. Literal blood on some of the walls of these places. Literal electroshocks, moments, and burns from, you know, from the renovations in this building. Literally a price was paid by so many. And I want to tell you, you are free. You are free from everything so-called prophesied over this church. And I want to exhort you to let it free you. You let it free too. Let it go. Don't, call, don't even call it to mind anymore. Don't even speak of it anymore. It's a new day. It's a new day. And the only way a new day can get ruined is when we start dragging the old day into the new day. It, the, the old stuff doesn't exist, literally doesn't exist, unless a saint of God uses his or her authority to give it a voice now on this side. So we repented of that, and I want to exhort you to join together in this culture. God's doing something new, and there's no need to even speak. We've learned some things as a church in 21 years. I'm not saying that we don't learn from our mistakes. But that's where wisdom is found. Or another, here's another Robert Lawsonism. Wisdom is not just found in learning from your own mistakes. The better kind of wisdom is learning from someone else's mistakes. That's a lot less painful, right? <laughs> So we don't need to be calling those things to mind because we want to be aware of what God's doing without looking behind us. What's the Father up to right now? Because this is going to be amazing. Our awareness of what God is doing and therefore our ability to carry it with Him can only be limited by what we carry of our past. How many know you can't, if Jesus says, here, I've got a burden for you to bear with me. You're in the yoke with me. Here, I want you to carry something with me. Our hands have got to be free. If we're carrying things from the past, and Jesus says here, I want you to carry something together with me. The, the truth is in, the, in our spirit, we're already full. We're already carrying too much. So many, you know, the, the regrets of, uh, that can make their way into the future, the pain of regret is most keenly felt when we haven't done things that God's put in front of us. There's actually a study that came out recently, I've seen in the news in a few different places, that you know, as, as people think about their lives and have regrets, the most painful regrets aren't concerning the things that we did that were bad or wrong. The most painful regrets of all are the opportunities that we missed along the way. For a Christian, that means God came and visited with us. It was a kairos moment, as we call it. A moment of opportunity where the Spirit of God called our attention to a need or called our attention to an opportunity, a dream, and we rejected it. And I want to propose that most of the reason why we reject it, we never say outright no to God. We just say, I've just got too much I'm carrying right now. I cannot put another thing on my plate. And maybe the problem is, sometimes legitimately we need to manage our time better, but I want to propose that maybe sometimes it's because we're carrying things that we're not supposed to still be carrying. That's the power of regret. That's a heavy weight to carry. So laying aside the weight and all the sin that besets us, we'll run our race with perseverance and look only at Jesus, who, by the way, is always in front of us. There's not a place he calls his people into where he's not already there. Safest place in the world 
is in a war zone right behind Jesus than in a peaceful country without him. What things need to be left behind in your life so that you can wholeheartedly embrace, receive, carry together with Jesus what lies ahead? Ponder that for a moment before the Lord. What are some things right now that are in your hands, spiritually speaking, that you're carrying right now that belong behind you on the other side of the cross? You know, you can nail things to the cross anytime you want to. As soon as they come to mind, you can crucify that thought. You know, it says in the scripture, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That's what we do in spiritual warfare. What do you do when you capture a demonic thought? Crucify it without remorse. Crucify it. Put it on the cross in Jesus and let it go. I feel like there's just a grace on us to let things go. Even things that, that are hard to let go. Even things that have haunted us for years. I just feel like there's a grace, there's a holy grace on us right now to be able to do it. So even if you've tried, maybe you've cried at the altar and you've been before the Lord about this over and over and over again, and it comes back again, there's a grace on it. I'm telling you, God is with us to give us a grace to be able to actually forget the things of the past and not to call them to mind or ponder them any longer. It's a grace that's on us. Paul said this, the sorrow that's according to the will of God, produces a repentance without regret. This is why repentance is such an awesome gift. Repentance is saying, what I'm doing right now, as that dude called it, like, has anybody ever done something stupid with their money? So when you can use that word even, say, man, that was really stupid of me to do that. That's good. You're free if you could call yourself stupid. I don't mean to get under that as a label. I mean, that was a stupid thing to do. I'm not stupid, so that was a stupid thing to do. You don't have to use that word. That might be too harsh. Right? We tell kids, don't use that word. It's too... We could say, man, I really shouldn't have done that. It could be an outright sin. It could be a sin of commission or a sin of omission, as we say it. It could just be, man, I, I shouldn't have spent my time doing that. I just wasted. You ever watch a really bad movie and just feel like I just got robbed of an hour and a half of my life? And then I'm mad at the director and producer, you know. Like, it's their fault that I stayed through it after five minutes in. I knew this is going to be a dumb movie. You know what I'm talking about? Whatever the reason is, when we repent, genuinely repent, it means change the way you think. I'm not going to do that again. I used to do things that way. Now I'm not going to do that. And when it's God who's at work doing that, it comes with no regrets, meaning that past that I just repented of, it's not going to find its way back into my present ever again. Genuine godly repentance is when you you know you've done it when all of that remains behind you. On the other hand, a worldly kind of regret, uh, the sorrow of the world produces death. So a worldly sorrow might be, I'm sorry because I got caught. Right? A thief gets caught robbing a house and he's sorry because he got caught in the act. A repentant thief is one who didn't get caught but comes back and returns everything, right? That's, that's one of the worldly kind of sorrows. Worldly sorrow is when I'm, I'm only sorry about what I did because there's a consequence to it. Worldly sorrow can also be, I'm going to work out my own salvation about this issue by beating myself up, by doing penance. I'm going to send myself to my room because God's not doing it, and therefore I've got to take care of my own punishment. Anybody else ever do that? Only like three of you? I feel very alone right now. I don't think I'm the only one who does that. You pun- we punish ourselves for what we've done because we can't accept the grace of God. This is why Paul said, I don't frustrate the grace of God. You know you can frustrate the grace of God? How do you frustrate the grace of God? By refusing to receive it. By saying, thanks, but I think I deserve punishment right now, so keep your grace and I'll, I'll take care of business here because my way will work. I know that I need to be taken out of the woodshed right now, and your grace, I'm just going to do it again if I receive grace from you right now. So I'm going to punish myself because that will work better. That's what we say when we don't receive the grace of God. That's what we're declaring. Maybe I said it better than, than, than your mind might come up with, but that's, that's what we say. God, your grace isn't going to work. I've got to punish myself. Let's, let's leave that behind in 2019. How about, how about we enter a new decade saying no more frustrating the grace of God? Because grace works every time. 
Every, genuine grace. I'm not talking about the greasy grace that just says, okay, I've gotten over. I'm not going to get punished for this. So I'm going to go do it again. That's not, you didn't get grace if that's the response. That's not repentance. That's not grace. Grace is, I've repented and I've received his grace now so that it's behind me for good. I'm not even going to talk about it again. I'm not going to ponder it. I'm not going to call it to mind. It's history now. And now I'm going to be able to move ahead. So when we fail to receive God's grace, we punish ourselves for our past, and that's how we enable the accuser to determine our destiny. See, because if we've if we're in the middle of punishing ourselves, we're giving ourselves a time out in the spirit or something like that, we withdraw from the people of God, we withdraw from the presence of God and all the other ways that we do it. We keep a distance from God. What we're doing at that point is saying, I'm not looking at what Jesus is doing right now. I'm too busy looking here and looking behind me to even gaze on the Lord. And so that means the accuser, the one who reminds us over and over again. Have you all discovered too, like I have, that the devil doesn't have to talk to us most of the time because we do a good enough job beating up on ourselves? That means he's gotten in our head somehow. That's what we call demonic strongholds. If there's a thought in our mind that says, I deserve to be punished for what I've done, that did not come from heaven. I deserve some kind of consequence for what I've done. I made my bed, and therefore I've got to lie in it. Those thoughts don't originate in heavenly places. That is not where that thought came from. Grab hold of it, arrest it, and throw it behind you where it belongs. And leave it in that place. Because our accuser will not determine our destiny. We can't lean forward into what God has when we're carrying the baggage of things past. Most often, when it comes to stepping into the will of God... It's not, the issue is not that we don't trust God. There are cases of that, right? We've talked about grief and we've talked about if we don't deal with our grief, we actually don't trust God anymore because we feel like he let us down. So next time he asks us to step out, we say, no, I don't think I'm taking another step to explain to me why this thing happened, why that disappointment came my way. That is a real thing. But I want to suggest that most of the time, when it comes to stepping out doing those crazy things in the will of God, stepping out where our expectation is that if God doesn't come through, this whole thing's going to fall apart. When we settle for the safe territory of being able to do everything in our life, even if God disappeared from it, this is a question that I ask myself at the end of every year. Focapuccio preached one for the ages in like 1992. Out of the proverb, ponder the path of your feet so that your ways might be established. In other words, take a look at where you're walking and make sure that you're walking in the presence of God, seeking the will of God, seeking to do all of life together with the Father. Ponder the path of your feet. So I discovered along the way a really good question to ask myself. If Jesus was taken out of your life right now, totally eradicated off the scene of your life in every way, what would be different about tomorrow? And then the, the answer to that can range everywhere from my life would fall to pieces and I wouldn't want to get out of bed, which is a good answer, to really I don't think much would be different at all because I feel like I could do everything in my life without him right now. That's the worst answer of all. So all of us are somewhere on that spectrum. I want to propose that the, the issue that we usually have if we're not walking with God is that we don't believe that he really should trust us. The knee-jerk response to everybody who's ever been asked to do something impossible by God was to reject it and say, you got the wrong guy. Moses argued with the burning bush. Gideon hid behind the wine press and argued with an angel who showed up to his on his door. Peter told the Lord, get away from me. I'm a man of unclean lips. Isaiah, in the heavenly places, taken up in a vision, standing before the throne of God, said, oh, I'm dead. I know God called me here, but I'm dead now because I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell among people with unclean lips. I had a lot of problem with lips back in the day. I've got issues in our knee-jerk response. Everybody who's ever been asked, I'm just saying this because it means we're in good company. Everybody who's been asked by God to do something which seems impossible is in a perfect place. Because we won't think, oh, I could do this without him. I got it from here which is the worst mistake a Christian can make. No, when we believe that, we're saying, okay, you got to help me here because I don't get why you would trust somebody like me to do something where really the kingdom of heaven depends on my faithfulness to this thing. 
So I want to propose today that God wants to restore our belief that he trusts us. That he trusts us. My son Aaron had an incident when he was younger. We were working in the shop. I could see that he was gifted and really enjoyed working with his hands. And so I had him out in the workshop, and I was just teaching him how to use power tools. I think he was like four or five. I'm kidding. <laughs> At some point when he was younger, I'm scary around power tools. No, so, so I was just teaching him how to use a skill saw and things like that, how to do it safely. And sure enough, him being Aaron, curious, curious George of a boy, he nearly cut off his fingers on the table saw. Because he was messing around, turning it on and seeing it keep spinning after you shut it off. And he was messing around. And his finger was like three inches from the blade. And it hadn't stopped spinning yet. So I grabbed him and pulled him away. And I thought, this is it. You know, I'd, I don't know. And I, I, I freaked him out for sure with my response because I was scared. So I went back to him and said, it's all right, Aaron. All right. So now you know that you should never do that. Never have your hand on the table saw while the blades are spinning. And, you know, at that moment... If I hadn't revisited the issue, he might have given up on what's now going to be his career for life. But I took him back in and said, Aaron, I believe you've learned your lesson and I trust you. Let's get back in there and try that again. Let's cut that again. I believe in you. I trust you. I believe you've learned and I trust you with this thing. Now, if that's this father who's got his own issues, how much more the heavenly father trusts you. He trusts you to do your portion of what's necessary for the kingdom of heaven to advance on the earth. He trusts you. He chose you, and he already knew all those things you're arguing with him about. All those things that you play in your mind, maybe even say out loud to the Father when he says, I want you to do something for me. And you say, no, I'm the wrong guy, and here's why. All of those thoughts, he already knew all of those failures, all those things that could become regrets. He already knew all that. And he said, oh, you're the perfect one for the job. In fact, I chose you because you did that. I chose you, Jamie, for promotion because I know that the pain of what you experienced 13 years ago, you're a changed man after what I've done in your life. And so I trust you with more wealth. I trust you with more responsibility. He trusts you. Regret has a hold on us. This is a discerning factor here. We know it has a hold on us when we limit God's will to things that seem safe. Things that we can control, things that we believe we know how it's going to turn out, things that we could do without the Lord together with us. When we stay in that safe territory, that's one way of knowing that we've got something of our past. We've got some kind of regret that's in there, pulling the strings to determine how far in this thing we're going to go. Are we going to be sold out Uh, The answer is yes before the Lord even tells us what it is that he's looking for. Or are we going to stay in this safe place where God will speak and we'll say, well, I'll think about it. I want to say, I teach this when we teach how to study the Bible. That understanding the word and the will of God, one of the preconditions is that a heart that says yes before it even knows what God's saying is the one who's going to have the full revelation. There's like a precondition. Some people don't understand the Bible or understand the Word of God because their heart's saying, well, let me read it first and I'll decide if I agree with that. So God, tell me what you want me to do and I'll decide if I agree that that's a good thing for me to do or not. We never say it out loud like that because even when I said that, like, that's ridiculous. Who would say that? But I would would suggest to you that if we live our entire life doing things that are possible without God, that we haven't yet stepped into that, that new realm. We haven't yet begun to partner with him on the new thing, which is going to involve doing things that stretch us beyond what we could have done without him. So Paul said this to the Philippians, classic verse, but I want to read it to you out of the Passion Translation. He said, I admit that I haven't yet acquired the absolute fullness that I'm pursuing, but I run with passion into his abundance. If you're following along, you got to memorize, not that I have already attained or have already been made perfect, but this much I do. That's the scripture we're in right now. So that I may reach the purpose that Jesus Christ has called me to fulfill and wants me to discover. Man, I love the way that, that the, the guy who translated the Passion got that verse. He's called us to fulfill something, 
But that, to just leave it at that is to be like, well, you're just a cog in a wheel in a machine or you're just a robotic kind of, this is my will and I want you to do it. He's got this thing in us, like this curiosity that says, I want you to discover my will. It's going to be like a, a nonstop treasure hunt in your life if you want. I'm going to move things in front of you and I want you to discover my will as we walk together. I want you to have this journey like kids, you know, on, on Christmas morning when they're looking at the packages going, I wonder what's in that. And there's this discovery about the will of God where it's an adventure. It's this sense of, I don't know what's going to happen next. I know that there's like all these personality types, right? And one of them is exceedingly cautious and needs to know everything before you're going to unwrap the package and do it. And that there's certain things that you got to do like that as opposed to, and you can tell, my personality is more, let's dive in face first and we'll figure out what happens next. Which scares the other, that other kind of people. Which is why I seem to be surrounded with that kind of people. It's good. It's a good balancing thing. But, but there comes a point when it comes to faith where all of us have got to be saying, all right, God, I don't know what's in that package, but I, my answer is yes. My answer is yes. Even if it's scary, even if it involves what's unknown, I want to discover your will. And I want to have this eager leaning in to what's next disposition in life. Because we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. It's an amazing phenomena how, why is it that when, when we think about what's going to happen tomorrow, why, is, why would the future be filled with negative thoughts? Why would the discovery of God's purposes involve anything that would produce fear? Right? Why would it ever be scary for God to come and speak to us and say, here's what I want you to do? Because we think that we have to work it all out without his grace, without his presence. We think God's just going to say, here, I want you to risk your life and be a sheep among wolves, and uh, good luck, I'll see you on the other side. He's just not like that. The disposition of the heart that knows him says, man, if there is something that appears scary, it's going to be a little bit more like a roller coaster ride, which I don't know if that's your flavor or not, but I love roller coasters. Not the spinny ones anymore. I'm too old for that. that you're going to spin them for days after one. But the roller coaster, you know that. Woo! You're safe. You're strapped in. You're not going to die. Right? You're going to be just fine with it. Oh, I wish I had Ivana's video on the skloosh. <laughs> I had this great video. I should have queued it up for today. Ivana last, well, last year, two years ago, on the skloosh at uh, Knobles Grove. And I was sitting behind her. And she didn't like doing those kind of rides. So I was sitting behind her. And I got my camera out. Well, this is going to be good. And all the way up on the, you know, it's going kick, 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 all the way up. It's going, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. Oh, there you are. I'm going to die, I'm going to die, and die. We got around, coming around the curve. I'm going to die, I'm going to die. And then we went down, ah! we got to the bottom, sploosh, and a splash. That was great. I want to do it again. <laughs> it's a classic. That's what it's like. The thing that we used to think was scary when we remember, I'm strapped in with Jesus. He's not going to allow harm to come my way. Even if I die, I don't die, I live again. Right? We are strapped in. We are safe. We can get on board. We can come along for a ri the ride of our lives. No more boring Christianity. Look, can we just put that aside once and for all? No more boring Jesus. He's not boring. He's scary fun. He, he said that the things he made his disciples do, you know, we're reading through John on Wednesday nights, which, by the way, we're back uh, next week in chapter 12. Uh, so you should join us if you haven't. But just seeing what Jesus, you know, they were always trying to stone him when he came to Jerusalem. But it wasn't just Jesus. There was all of his disciples with him. And they're following him. And there's this crowd of people. They're picking up stones. And his disciples are all be like, can we go now? I think we should leave. I think we should exit. Stays left. And they're all there. They're going to stone us too for being his disciples, man. And they were along this journey with him, but they stayed with him. They've somehow felt safer with Jesus, surrounded by a crowd with stones in their hands, than they did back out fishing on the, on the ocean, on the sea. Well, they were never catching fish anyway. You ever notice that? Jesus rescued them. Every time they were fishing, they weren't catching fish. They needed a miracle anyway. Discover the will of God. So I don't depend on my own strength to accomplish this, right? That's the secret. 
I know that whatever God's bringing me into, it's not going to be by my strength. I've already settled that issue. I know that it's going to take his grace. I know that if his supernatural power and love doesn't come through for me, I know that my life's over. There's no way I'll be able to do what's ahead without it. But I do have this compelling focus. I forget all of the past as I fasten my heart to the future instead. I forget all of the past. How many of you know that forgetting is not just for those of us who don't remember things? <laughs> yes, I said us. God forgets things. It's not because he's some doddering old man up there in heaven who's going senile. God forgets things on purpose. God forgets things because to call them to memory, to remember them, is to put it back together and empower it. So, Forgetting, I'm intentionally going to forget the past. I may not be able to burn the memory out of my head, but I can change how I remember that thing. It's not the things that have happened to us in life that make us who we are. It's how we interpret it, how we remember it, how we ponder it that determines our future. I've met some of the most incredible human beings in the world in Liberia who after 16 years of civil war, seeing their friends and Parents and sisters have all kinds of horrific things done to them. I've seen some of the most joy-filled, powerful Christians I've ever met in that nation. So if it really is the trauma of things past that determine how you're going to live your future, there shouldn't be any saints in Liberia right now doing anything for the kingdom. They've got a past. that are none of us that can even relate with the things these people have endured. And yet you get in the midst of them, and they're encouraging you to be joyful in the Lord, to give generously. I mean, they're just incredible like that. It's not what's happened to us that determines our future. It's what we, how we empower it and how we remember it. So we can remember the pain, the, the sin, the sorrow, the, the things we're remorseful about, a certain way that empowers that, or we can remember it in a way that says, God is able to make even that work together for my good because I love him and because I'm called according to his purpose. That's, that's how we do it. So I fasten my heart to the future instead. I run straight for the divine invitation. Man, I love that phrase. There's Jesus in front of us saying, come on in, the water's fine. I tasted death, I conquered it. Went down to the depths of the grave, emptied it. Robbed it of all of its power. So there's nothing to be afraid of. Come on, kids. Come into this dark part of the world with me. Come into this place where they're killing Christians. Come into this realm where, you know, you're going to be rejected and you're going to be a social outcast for my sake, which is really, can we be real? That's the worst it gets in our country. I mean, what? so you might lose your job for being bold and being passionate and being out there. Okay, you know, you're not losing your head. Right, Christmas Day over in, was it Iran or Afghanistan? Twelve Christians beheaded on Christmas Day. That's normal in many parts of the world. We don't have any of that kind of thing. So what's this fear that's got us held back from manifesting, from ministering, from praying, from speaking boldly the Word of God? We've got these paper tigers that hold the church back. And here, let's dispense with those things because there's this divine invitation of Jesus saying, come on. Even if you lose everything you've got, you've gained heaven for it. You will never be able to outgive me. Come on in, kids. Come on in. Come and join me over here in this place where everything is sorrowful, where everything is fearful, where everybody's angry. Come and work in this place over here where, where like every other adjective is, has, starts with F or S. You know, and that's, that's your, come on into this place and minister my love in this place. I'm, I'm already here. Here's my divine invitation to join me and be my co-partner in this. Carry this thing with me. Reaching the heavenly goal, gaining the victory prize through the anointing of Jesus. So the most painful kind of regret, the kind of regret that leads to like midlife crisis craziness is when we have opportunities to fulfill our dreams and destiny and we miss them. That's the regret that haunts you later on in life. Not the things that, right? We, forgiveness is something we practice very frequently as Christians. We know how to go to the cross and receive forgiveness for our sins. I don't believe that's really our problem. 
For most of us, the issue is, I've missed so many dreams and opportunities, it's too late for me now. It's too late. I've gone too far. I've been gone too long. I've missed too many opportunities. I I feel this regret and remorse of things. I'm I'm just bound by this thing, and I just don't know. Well, how about Caleb at 80 years old coming into the promised land and saying, I'm feeling good. I want that mountain. I want the roughest territory in the whole promised land as my portion. Yeah, I'm 80, but 80 is the new 30 for me. And I want that mountain right there. Too old? Man, dude was just wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, having spent the first 40 years of his life as a slave. 40 years wandering around in the wilderness because he and Joshua were the only two in the whole nation that had enough faith to trust God to go into the promised land. How many know bitterness? 40 years of that? Man, I'd be, I'd be so mad at everybody else after circling around in the wilderness for all those, not Caleb. Caleb would be like, I want that mountain. I don't care how long it takes for me to take that mountain. I'm taking that mountain. It's not too late for me because I'm getting something from my kids and for their kids for generations to come. So here's the word of the Lord. I'm going to close with this. Isaiah 54. I'm going to leave with a challenge coming into a new year. As you're making whatever resolutions you make, does anybody do that anymore? I don't do that anymore. I just figure it's just one more way for me to lie to myself. I'm going to just do it. I'm not going to resolve to do it. I'm just going to do it. And we'll see if I do it or not. I have to use reverse psychology on myself because, it, you know. So here's what the Lord said at the beginning of this year. I don't want to leave us with a challenge to keep pressing in on it. How many of you know God doesn't have to speak some new word every year? <laughs> There's some pastors that feel this pressure. i got to have a new scripture, a new prophecy for the year. Like this would be the time if you subscribe to any prophetic lists. There will be about 500 prophecies about what God's going to do in this coming year. And it covers the entire Bible by the time you first read them. Like, i got to have something new for the new year because we turn the page of a calendar. God doesn't always do that. The seasons of the Spirit aren't bound to the calendar. Seasons of the Spirit end when harvest time comes. Seed time and harvest. Those are the seasons of the Spirit. And we're in a season of harvest right now. So here's the word of the Lord. Shout for joy, barren one, you who have borne no child. I want to say to you, that if you have never given birth to something in the Spirit, let me explain what that means. Meaning you've never done something where you know the Spirit of God built something up on the inside of you, gave you a word, gave you an anointing, gave you a career, a destiny, or something like that, that you meditated on and it grew on the inside of you like a natural child grows on the inside of his or her mother. And then ministered that thing and watched something come alive. Watched a person come alive. Watched a ministry. Watched a business. Watched a school come alive. That's what spiritual birthing looks like. So if you've never done that before, this is for you. Break forth into joyful shouting and cry aloud, you who have not travailed. So there's an emphasis on that. Childbirth does involve travail. It involves that transition, the pain of transition involves all of what happens when you give birth to something. If you haven't yet experienced the pain of enduring through that and giving birth to something that you know, Jesus and I, we did that. That wasn't just me doing something here. Jesus and I, we got together and boom, look at what happened. We got life someplace where there was no life before. If, if you in times past have gotten to that place where the will and word of God was tested and you didn't see it through to the other side, how many of you know there's no pain like that of remorse? There's no regret quite like that one. When you realize that times got tough and I bailed on the will of God for that. We've all done it. Uh, there's an, oh, there's not anybody in here who thinks, oh man, he's only talking to me. I'm talking to me first. All of us have done that. There came some kind of opposition, and we pulled away. And so we didn't give birth to something that God was doing or wanted to give birth to through us. I want to tell you now that the Lord's saying, that regret belongs behind you. Don't even think about it again. 
remember a couple of weeks ago we were praying for some folks here who had people that they loved die and they didn't know the Lord when they died and they were filled with this regret, this feeling of regret. Man, I wish I would have ministered Christ one more time to them. And, and that, that pain of I missed an opportunity. Maybe I could have been the one who brought them to salvation. That, that kind of regret will eat you alive. And the Lord's saying, look, maybe you didn't travail to the point of giving birth to a child. But I want you to break forth into joyful shouting and cry aloud. Because the sons of the desolate one, that's us who haven't given birth, you're going to be more numerous than the sons of the married woman. I'm going to give you double what you think was lost for good. I'm going to restore to you more than what you left behind. So leave that regret behind you and step into something new because I have ideas for you. If you'll let go of that regret, if you'll let go of how you bailed or how you failed or how all, whatever it is, all the woulda, coulda, shouldas, if you'll let go of those things, I've got more in mind for you in the future. How many of you know that God can do in a year what takes us 40 years to do? You've all experienced that? In some measure at least? That when we give something over to God, what looked like, man, this is going to take, this can be a, a, such a mess, it's going to take forever before this thing gets right again, and God comes and he does it in a week. And then there's sometimes, yeah, God takes us sometimes on a journey because he's training us for reigning, training for reigning. He wants us to walk a process. Some people, they come to the altar, they cry, and God heals them of their drug addiction. Some people, they're going to go through rehab with Jesus, and they're going to learn about how to be disciplined. They're going to learn some things in their lives. The process is up to you and God and whatever is necessary, but the Lord says, I'm going to restore to you. The, you know in Joel how it says, I will restore to them the years that the locusts have eaten. How do you restore years? That's a miracle. You can add years. God didn't say, I'm going to let you live another 20 years so you can make up for those wasted 20. He said, no, nah, I'm going to restore everything that you lost in that wasted time. I'm just going to make it as if you didn't waste 20 years. How about that one for size? Do you believe that God will do that? Because that's just how gracious he is. For those who, who are seeking his face and going face first into his destiny. So he says this, So therefore, with all those regrets dealt with now, enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Spare not. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your pegs. For you'll spread abroad to the right and the left. Your descendants are going to possess nations. They'll resettle all the desolate cities. Fear not. You'll not be put to shame. You won't be humiliated. You will not be disgraced. You're going to forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood. And you'll remember no more. You're going to have no regrets. You're going to move into a season of life right now. I'm prophesying. You're moving into a season of your life. We are moving into a season of our lives where the Lord's going to make us forget because we're going to be so overwhelmed with what's come that we're going to forget what we lost. So enlarge, it says, enlarge the dwelling place, which means broaden your vision. Enlarge, have a blueprint, have something, get together with the Lord as we close out this year. I'd encourage you to spend some time before the Lord about this and ask him, Lord, help me to have a bigger vision Restore to me a vision that truly involves a God who's so big it's scary. Help me to see beyond what I think is possible. Help me not to miss your word when it comes and says, I've got things in mind for you that you could have never come up with for yourself. Expand, enlarge our vision before you see it come to pass. That's the beauty of this passage is something's going to happen so I want you to do this in light of that. I want you to get ready for something that you don't see with your natural eyes yet, but I'm showing you in the Spirit. You're going to have a lot of kids, so you're going to need a bigger tent. That's the gist of this passage. So stretch out your heart. If you've been withholding your heart because of hurts from the past, if you've been kind of a little tentative about reaching out to the people around you who need the love of God, a little, little kind of guarded, toward relationships, toward people around you, the Lord's saying, stretch your heart out. Stretch it out. Enlarge the curtain. Stretch out the curtains of your tent means make a bigger tent. More room for people on the inside. I believe the Lord's going to give many of us, all of us really, the capacity to love people that before we'd have never invited into our tent. 
we would have said, this is a, a new mindset about outreach. I'm kind of getting this download right now, so bear with me. We think outreach means go out there and minister to people, which it does. I'm not saying, you know, that, that we don't go out. But outreach isn't just let's go over there and minister to them in their place. Outreach is let me go out there to invite them into something. I'm not afraid to have you in my house. I'm not afraid for you to sit at my table. I'm not afraid for you to come and stay with me because the Lord's made me able to stretch out my heart to accommodate things that before I never would have invited in. Extend or lengthen your cords, it says, which means to think of your life as having a much bigger footprint than you currently believe it has. So there, I believe there are many among us who, because of your position on your job, you don't believe that you have a very big footprint in what you do. And what I want to say from the Lord is that you have no idea the extent of your influence and how many people are watching you. How many people are influenced because of those you've influenced who have heard the story. You are ministering to people that you haven't even met yet. Your influence over those that you work with, those you live with, those that you're neighbors with, your influence has extended so far that you'd be blown away if you knew. You know how they say, like this is the concept of Facebook, like you're four people away from knowing most everybody in the world? And it's, Facebook has proven that. There's actually, they're studying it now with Facebook, that it's true. That you're friends with somebody, they got friends, they got friends, and you're four relationships away from everybody in the world. Think of that when it comes to your kingdom influence. Extend, lengthen your cords, reach out in, in our heart's mind, in our, our mind's eye, reach out beyond. Believe, pray, minister with a mindset that says, What I can see with my eye isn't all that's going on. I've got influence and I have ministry that goes far beyond this place. I might be just one little cog in this machine and the CEO doesn't even know my name. But when I minister the love of God in this place, when I minister faithfully, manifest the righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, which is the kingdom of God. Now I got that song in my head now too, thanks. When I minister that way, there are people being touched and who are going to have an effect that's far beyond what I even know. Strengthen your pegs, it says. That's, that's the foundation. In order to accommodate, if you get a picture of a big tent, you know, when you put up your camping tent, the stakes are about this big. You ever put up one of those circus tents? We put up one of those for an outreach we did in Boston. It accommodated, I don't know, like 500 people underneath. Man, those stakes were about three feet high. Those are the ones you get in the sledgehammer crews out, you know, to pound them in like that. Why? Because it's a big tent. Big tent needs a bigger foundation. The only thing that can limit this, this whole thing, you could, you know, go a mile wide in terms of stretching out to accommodate things, but if the foundation's not strong underneath, if those pegs aren't big enough, you try to put a circus tent up and use camping tent-sized pegs, that's a disaster waiting to happen. And unfortunately, that's how a lot of the Pentecostal and charismatic movement has gone. Excelling at the gifts, excelling in evangelism. It's the fastest growing sect of Christianity. Why? Because we finally remembered, oh yeah, we need some power along with this gospel. Right? Ooh, it's been there all along. Who knew? Go out and do the stuff Jesus did. So it's happening, but a lot of times the ministry has collapsed because it's been kind of this quiet rejection of those really cautious personalities that I shared about before that I know and love, even when I drive them crazy. Because that's the pegs. That's the foundation. For all of us individually, it means get rooted and established in love, rooted and established in Christ. We don't stretch out and go far until we've got our pegs deeply founded in Christ, that we are walking with Him. We're talking with Him. We're in His Word. We're in His presence. We're living in such a way that whatever comes in, we're more than adequately prepared to accommodate it because we've got Him as our partner and we as His. So, God, help us to enter into the new year 
with such an expectation that everything that you said you're going to do, you are going to do. And thank you for the privilege of being the ones that you're going to use to see awesome and amazing things happen. Give us great grace as we close out a year, entering a new decade, that we'd come in with a hope-filled expectation that we ain't seen nothing yet, that the Holy Ghost is just getting warmed up when it comes to what Hillside's called to, when it comes to all of us and what we're called to, that we've only just seen the first fruits of what lies ahead. Give us that kind of a hope-filled expectation for what lies ahead. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you as you prepare to enter the new year. Happy New Year. Love you guys, and we'll see you back here in the new decade.